to the fourth episode of the sixth, sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this pro- episode, we're going to interview the Ubuntu community manager, Jono Bacon, and have some gooey love. Not with Jono. <laughs> That's Wise. separate. <laughs> Plus, we'll go over your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the RSC channel. I'm Laura, and joining me are Mark. Hello. Alan. Hello. And Tony. Good evening. Alan, your throat's still bad then? Yes. Oh, that's lasted a whole week. Yes. Wow. It's, you should see that. Uh, get that scene too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, so, Mark, what have you been up to lately? Not much. No, I can tell from the uh, blog, the wiki, but right. nothing? No, uh, no. I might have done something, but ask someone else. Okay, Alan. Uh, I discovered that uh, my Thunderbird folder was 35 gigabytes in size and wow. it's your email client yes on my local machine are you using pop 3 no imap oh, and i dear. sync all the folders down to my local machine wow and uh, i thought this was a bit excessive and thunderbird was dragging like a dog can i mention this online and uh, the, while i was trying to figure out how to make it drag less i switched to mutt and i've used mutt in the past as a command line email client and um I had to do a bit of configuring and set the colours in a config file and uh, tell, it, like fun. tell it where all my folders are. It is actually quite good fun. That's something I like about I don't know what it is about Mutt, but I really like it. And it's really quick as well. But um, I then discovered that if you compact all your folders in Thunderbird, uh, it goes down from 35 gig to 2 gig. Wow. Which is quite a saving. On That's my, impressive. On my SSD. Does it make it faster though? Yes. Oh, okay. Which is good. So, so I've um, I've switched to using. Well, I kind of like switch between the two. I sometimes use Mutt and sometimes use um, Thunderbird. But what I've done is I've got um, a program called Offline IMAP, which I think we've this mentioned. This was a command line love several was, seasons ago, it wasn't was. it? So I'm running Offline IMAP on my laptop, and every as a cron job, every five minutes it wakes up, goes and gets all my mail from the mail server, and puts it on my laptop. So that's all nicely synchronized. So my laptop now has all my mail local. Is that while we're streaming? <laughs> yes, every five minutes. Uh, and then I just run Mutt in a command line, and it connects to the local mail directory where all my mail is. And so reading the mail is really fast because it's coming off the SSD locally. It's not going over yeah. to a server. So it's like double faster than Thunderbird because it's not double a fast. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know what else you could do? You could what? delete some of your email when you're done with it. Uh, <laughs> nah. I, I, I tried that and I'll I didn't. Never I, catch was, on. I wasn't comfortable with it. I, did, I didn't like that. Hmm. So, but yeah, I'm really enjoying that. I really like it. It's, it's really fast and um, and offline IMAP is super because when I'm on my local machine and I delete a thousand emails and then just close Matt and walk away. The next time offline IMAP runs, it synchronizes those deletions up to the server. So uh, it's That's all nice. An HTML email. Uh, yeah, but it'll view HTML email and it'll launch wow. PDF viewers and all that kind of stuff and uh, sorts folders and highlights things in colors and and it'll do GPG sign and encrypt my email and all that. So it's kind of better than Thunderbird, really. Have you seen Geary? I have seen Geary, yeah. Did you think about that or was it not something you thought about? Uh, I didn't touch Geary because I... You didn't have a long enough barge pole? Co- <laughs> I know a co-worker who tried it and it it, um, it had some issues and, and I didn't really want to try something that was early stages of development. Okay. I, I wanted to try something tr- trusted, which I know Mutt is. Okay. So Geary is an email client written by the same people who made Shotwell, but yes, it is in early up. stages of development. It is, and actually they recently blogged that they're um, they're doing a Kickstarter campaign soon to uh, fund further development of Geary. Oh, okay. So it's going to get better, but right now I, don't, I, I, I think swapping Thunderbird for Geary, for me, it wouldn't have been the thing to do with a two gigabyte mailbox. Yeah. So, uh, that's why I chose Mutt, and I love Mutt. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's well established. So that's what I did. What did you do, Laura? Uh, I've been blogging and tweeting about my friend's um, little boy who's got cancer. So, oh, and that's he, a change of gears. It's a change of gears, but it's good because in just under two weeks, they've raised about £11,000. Wow. It's wow. incredible. Is but, this for him to do a medical treatment abroad? Yeah, he needs to get some sort of preventative treatment abroad to stop him getting it again once he's cleared right. it here. Um, so they need £250,000. So wow. we're blogging and tweeting and stuff. That's cool. what we've been cool. doing. Are you going to put a link in the show notes? I will. Awesome. Excellent. 
Okay, well, we shall get on and interview John O'Bacon then. We're joined on the line by Jono. How are you doing, Jono? Good, good. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad. How's things as the community manager for, for Ubuntu? Things are good. Things have been a little uh, feisty recently, but uh, <laughs> I think overall everything's going pretty good. Um, yeah. Why are they feisty, Jono? Well, everyone's got their own viewpoint on this. I mean, I think that what's been happening recently is there was... Um, there was a set of announcements um, that I think members of our community were a surprised about, um, b a little confused about, and I think the uh, the c element of this is there was quite a lot of them in a short period of time, and I think that that caused some folks in our community to feel a bit a bit unsettled about some things. Um, but um, you know, I think we've been making some good progress in terms of discussing those things and discussing the good aspects, the bad aspects. Like I've come away from this discussion with some things that I'd like to fix the next time we have to do something like this. Um, and I think, you know, people are more aware of why those decisions are made now. So they were all decisions and announcements that were made without community involvement. And that's what people are upset about. Yeah, I think, I think that's part of it. I mean, I think each one of these things has, has kind of got, different perspectives. So for example, Mia, you know, the new display server from that Canonical's been working on. You know, there are some people who feel like we should have just gone ahead with Wayland. Uh, and there's a set of technical reasons why Wayland wasn't decided upon. Uh, irrespective of the technical reasons, there are some people who basically feel like we shouldn't have gone with making our own. We should have just focused on Wayland. And then there's some people who don't like the fact that that was something that was decided upon previously and there wasn't any community involvement there. Uh, and you know, I think I, I can I can see multiple perspectives in this in this in this manner because, on one hand, we you know there's no point as chasing after a technology that ultimately isn't going to meet the needs of Ubuntu. But on the other hand, um, you know this is open source, and what we do is we collaborate with each other. So, well, on the subject of collaboration, we, uh, there's been some uh, unrest outside our community with a feeling that we're raining on the parade of um, Wayland by giving misinformation and uh, poorly communicating why we chose to write our own display server and not use Wayland, and also possibly miscommunicating the features of Wayland and the potential Wayland has. How, how, can, how do we fix that? Yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's a, a few things wrapped up in that. One is... Almost every announcement that we ever do, people say you could have done a better job with that, and you know, I think that's true. I mean, there's always things that we can do to improve. I think the thing about the Wayland thing, and the, the Mir team will, I think, openly accept this, is that the way in which they presented their case was not as good as it, as it could have been. Uh, and then, you know, Chris Holes Rogers weighs in on Google Plus and just instantly provides a really nice level of technical detail that I think provided a, a, a lot of context around it. There are, there are some people, though, who I think feel that that it was a, a social faux pas that we decided to go with Mia. And I, I see things a little differently here. My view has always been if you're if a company or an individual is investing their time and energy into creating free software, they have every right to decide on how that's going to be built and to make that along, you know, to, to build that to their needs. So as an example, the example I've used in the past when I've described this viewpoint is Ubuntu accomplishments. Um, that was something that I came up with the idea of it with and talked it through with Ack and I did all the work in building that first prototype of it. And if I'm going to spend my time and effort doing that, then I'll make unilateral decisions about how that works. But sure. then, but, 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 then you, Rafal you... Joins, but I was going to say, then Rafal joins the project, and now he's putting his time and effort into, into, into that. Now I can't make the unilateral decisions anymore. It's socially required, I think, that I collaborate with him. So right. but... to me, like the idea of just building Mia... There's nothing wrong with that, but now we have to we have to have to collaborate with people. Sure, but given that Ubuntu is you know quite a big heavyweight in the Linux open source world, you know we get we get news articles about us, we get um, a lot of brand recognition in mainstream press. For us to yeah. go out and say, "Hey, you sh you know Wayland doesn't do what what you think it does, accurately or not." 
um, it's not quite the same as you with accomplishments. You having your own little siloed application that doesn't really have any adverse effect on anyone else outside your community. Can you see that you know, we, we have the potential yeah. to adversely affect other projects like you know, KDE, like Wayland, like Gnome? And we, I, that, that, I think, is where people have a problem. Yeah, and I, I think that's the case. But I think I think that's that's just the difficulty of being a project that's out in the limelight. I mean, you know, the reason why we decided not to go ahead with X and, and to move to something different was because it involves a lot of technical baggage that's going to restrict our growth and moving forward. The technical assessment made by the Mir team was that um, it's from what I can tell is it's not about adding features to Wayland. It's that. Wayland would have features that we would want removed. That it, it, the Wayland would be bigger than we'd like it to be, effectively, um, and that's a difficult conversation to have with a community that's already got an idea of where it's moving forward. There's definitely, there's no doubt in my mind that the 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 initial mere justification, like the spec, could have been improved. But I think that even if we, you know, the idea of, of doing something different is always controversial. The most important thing is whether you're doing something different for the right reasons and. Um, you know, it does affect, I mean, it does affect other desktops. I mean, it affects, you know, arguably Ubuntu is the most popular Linux desktop and we've decided to build a display server and that puts GNOME and KDE as an example in an interesting position. Uh, you know, they, they have, they can either decide, um, or they can support both and, um, they have decided, I mean, GNOME has announced today that they're going to focus on Wayland and KDE. The KWIN guys basically said we're not focusing on Mir. I think yes. that those are. I think that they're pretty emotional reactions to it. My hunch here. Sure, I mean there is an element that it feels like we're burning bridges with um, our partners in the open source world, like the KDE and GNOME developers. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know how how long that um, that you know we won't accept your stuff will last. Um, we've had experience of that in the past. Um, are we doing anything to rectify that, to fix that? At the moment, all I'm seeing is lots of arguments on the internet. Is there anything happening behind the, you know, behind the scenes to, to fix that? Yeah, I mean, the, to me, the most important thing that we can do right now is I don't think it's worthwhile getting into, like, like you just said, Popey, I don't think it's worthwhile as getting into a row with people about whether Mir was the right or the wrong thing to do. The most important thing that we can do is make sure that Mir is a a collaborative community that anyone can participate in and um and we should work hard to make sure that it you know it's open and accessible to everybody so if someone in the kd community does decide that they want to produce support for uh, for kwin as an example then the mir team should be open and respectful of that um to me the best thing we can do right now is focus on on building great software i think one of the mistakes that happened here is that mark made a commitment to wayland years ago when the, the nature of Ubuntu was quite different. Back then we were just focusing on the desktop and now it's different with the phone and the tablet and all that kind of stuff. But literally every week since Mark said that, people have asked me, so what's going on with Wayland? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not yeah. surprised that there's uh, a certain amount of consternation around it. you know. But, so um, then a flip-flop really is what it's seen as rather than a, you know, a slow yeah. trickle away from Wayland over a series of blog posts or you know blueprints or UDS sessions as you would normally say, oh, like we're moving away from, you know, Banshee towards Rhythmbox or something, rather than, you know, flicking the switch and suddenly announcing a new product. And by the way, we're throwing out this thing that we said two years ago. You know, I think that, that um, well, flip-flop, for want of a better word, is probably yeah. what's irritated a number of people. Yeah, I, I'd say so. And the other thing as well is um, there's a lot of arguing going on with people who don't really know anything about either. Like there's a lot of people who have a perception of what Wayland is and a lot of people have a perception of what Mir is, both of which are technically inaccurate. And also there was this kind of presumption, this kind of uh, back of the napkin presumption that Wayland is just, that's what it's going to be for the replacement for X. Whereas in reality, Wayland doesn't actually ship on anything yet. So in, in my mind, this, and this is probably going to sound a little controversial, there is an opportunity here for some competition. Like I, One of the things, the best things about open source in my mind is that we don't just have Unity. We have... GNOME and KDE and XFC and all the rest of them because it creates a little competition between them. And to me, irrespective of what Mark Shuttleworth wants or what um, you know the Wayland community wants, what's going to win out is good software. Like if Mir sucks, then no one's going to use it. Uh, if Wayland sucks, then no one's going to use it. So whoever builds the best display server that delivers 
the best display server experience to users, then that to me that's that's where it's going to move forward. Um, this kind of like political arguing isn't really getting anyone anywhere. So the relationship between uh, Ubuntu or Canonical and other projects seems to be changing and seems to be going through a bit of a rough patch, but also the relationship between Canonical and the Ubuntu community seems to be uh, a bit up and down at the moment as well. How do you think that relationship's changed? I think it's changed in a few areas. So one is that, um, you know, uh, I think Ubuntu itself has changed over the years. In the, in the, in, in, like when I joined Canonical back in 2006, um, our community was excli- explicitly focused on building the operating system. So, um, and, you know, there was, there, it wasn't just engineering work. There was uh, people who were passionate around the edges around that, people like in loco teams and people who are doing documentation and translations and whatever else. But these days, you know, um, Ubuntu is not just a project um, where people are passionate about the platform. It's also, it's a product as well. It's, you know, we, we want to reach out to people who don't really care about how Ubuntu is put together. They just want to write apps for it. And we've had a lot of people focusing on that. And some of the feedback I've been, since all of this kicked off, I've been just hopping onto a bunch of phone calls with various people in our community, to just get some, you know, feedback about what they think. And one of the pieces of feedback that I've heard is, some people feel like with all the focus on app developers, it's as if Canonical doesn't really care about build those people who want to contribute to the platform itself, uh, which I don't think is true. It's just about, you know, we've just been corralling our resources around focusing on that. Because at the end of the day, Ubuntu on clients is not going to be successful if we don't have apps. Like, you can make the nicest phone and tablet you want, but if people can't get the apps that they want, then it's not really worth a lot. So that's one of the reasons why we've been focusing on that. But I think part of it's that, that the, like the, the Ubuntu isn't just this OS that it used to be. And I think that's been a bit unsettling for, for some people. But I'd say the other thing as well is that um, there's always been a, a tense like a, there's always been a tense relationship between companies and communities. And this happens between Red Hat and Fedora as well. And it's happened with Canonical and, and our community where like the social expectations of what the co- company does is not seen as the same thing as, uh, as uh, uh, you know, as what the community thinks it should be. So as an example of that, like making decisions about things privately in some parts of the community is seen as a terrible thing. Um, whereas sometimes you need to make those decisions to move something forward. So, for example, the big splash, the fact that Ubuntu Phone wasn't shared private, that wasn't shared previously, um, and then there was a the big splash, was actually really beneficial in terms of getting Ubuntu on CNN and on Engadget and places like that. But it frustrated some members of our community, and I can understand why. Would it be, um, w- would it be fair to say then that the relationship that Canonical wants to have with the community is closer to something like the Photoshop community, for example, where people are very committed users and and want to help enhance the community and provide mutual support, but isn't able to fundamentally uh, contribute to the direction of the software? I I don't think so. I I mean, I I can see how it might be perceived as that way. I think the challenge here, and this is probably going to sound a little bit uh, egotistical on behalf of Canonical, but I think what we're doing here with Ubuntu is really genuinely, it's not, not really been done before. Um, like we've always had Linux distros who've, who've, you know, really good Linux distros who've produced um, an easy to use experience for a particular demographic of people, such as, you know, I think it's probably safe to say that Fedora primarily focuses on Linux enthusiasts. Uh, the same thing with Debian. Whereas what we're doing with Ubuntu is we're really trying to get to that mass user adoption kind of thing. And that's resulted in a series of difficult decisions that we've had. And I've never, I haven't seen my experience of Linux. I've never seen this kind of focus on a a desktop distribution before that's also trying to hit the phone and the tablet um, and challenging some of the status quo that we see in in our existing communities. So 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 I think when Mark blogs about... um, you know, how he thinks it's uh, ridiculous that people want to make Linux hard to use. You know, I, I'm sure people don't want to make Linux hard to use, but I have tried to use Arch and it was hard. <laughs> um, you know, are, are, is the attrition that we're seeing, would you say, those kinds of people? The kinds of people who actually quite like it being hard, quite like it being exclusive, not necessarily elitist, but, you know, don't necessarily want to target mom and pop. I, I'd say it's partially that. I mean, I, the one thing I'm conscious that we don't do is we don't like stick our fingers in our ears 
uh, canonical or in, in the Ubuntu community to the criticism. I think there is some fair criticism out there. Like a good example is uh, a member of the IRC team said, you know, you announced the phone and we got a ton of questions about it and we had no idea how to answer those questions. And that's, that's my fault. I should have helped to put together, you know, some more information for our loco teams and our IRC community and some other parts to help better prepare them instead of just presuming that just my team's going to get all the, all the questions and canonical, you know, um, marketing side. But there are definitely, there, to me, there's definitely, there's, there's, there's a demographic inside of the Linux community that believes that Linux should be the domain of people who are technically experienced. And I fundamentally disagree with that. Uh, to me, that's not what free software is about. It's about making technology that anyone can use. Um, and I think... Mark kind of pushed up against that and basically said, you know, those people who want Ubuntu to just focus on Linux enthusiasts, they're not going to be happy. And I think that's a pretty fair statement. It seems clear that uh, Canonical is trying to do something very clever with the integration of Ubuntu across the different platforms. And, and it is a very difficult technical task. Right. Does that mean that things like the community council and the other community structures that were put in place and the technical board and that sort of thing, do they even have a role anymore? Uh, yeah, I think they do. I mean, uh, the, it's, it's, it's weird because the community council and the technical board, as an example, have generally been pretty reactive governance structures. So the, te the community council and the tech board don't tend to go out and actively lead and say, we should move Ubuntu in this direction or this direction. Uh, the community council does do some leadership in terms of, you know, we should, you know, we should refine our membership processes or this, that and the other. But it's generally very, much very focused on the nuts and the bolts of how our community, how our community works. But most of the work done by those governance groups is in response to something. Um, one thing that I think we need to do, and this was actually at, at a call yesterday with some members of the community council. One thing that we're going to be putting in place is a regular uh, meeting probably on a Google Plus Hangout, where we have a member of each of the different governance boards, uh, and I'll probably be, be there for my team, where the community can just raise topics that they feel are challenged in our community right now, and we can just discuss them. Uh, I think one of the problems that we have right now is that we don't have a, a good forum in which we can get our leaders together to solve these kinds of problems. Um, that that it, used to happen. It used to be that people would turn up to community council meetings, IRC meetings, and basically ask random questions of Mark and whoever else was on the CC. It, yeah. it, it does feel like there there is a, a greater separation between those governance structures um, and yeah. you know, the world at large. That's definitely changed. I, I think so. And I, I think this, to me, there's a ton of things that we can do to, to, to improve the situation. I mean, I know that, that, you know, this last week was pretty demotivating for some members of our community. But I think one thing that people, as far as I'm concerned, if you're a, a member of the community and you're interested in working on a project that's run by Canonical, such as Mir or Ubuntu Touch, you should expect that, that you can collaborate on that project and everything is done out in the open. As far as I'm concerned, as far as Rick Spence is concerned, the you know, VP of engineering at Canonical as well, uh, there's always going to be some private projects at Canonical that with customers and whatever else, but those are the exceptions to the rule. Everything should be done out in the open. And one of the things I'm working on right now is working with our engineering managers and tech leads to help, to help grow that and, and continue that culture. But then the other thing is we can work better as a community in how we solve these kinds of problems. And that's, I think that's what we need to do in moving forward. Um, and then just also kind of open up the feedback loop. You know, one of the things that, and I, I hold myself responsible for this, is that, uh, you know, we used to do surveys more often just to get feedback from people about what's working well, what isn't working well. We haven't done one of those for a while. And I think one of the reasons for that is just everyone's been so busy. And mm. um, I, was chatting to, I was chatting to someone about this yesterday that I saw this brilliant, um, this brilliant video on YouTube of John Cleese from the Monty Python crew doing a talk at like an innovation conference where he was talking about how to be creative. Um, it's, it's really good. And he basically says, you know, when, when you're just really busy all the time and you're constantly replying to emails and in meetings and whatever else, it gives you less chance. It gives you less of an opportunity to be creative and to kind of look at the bigger picture. And I think that's one of the things that we've been suffering from a little bit yeah. in canonical that we're so busy, like on, uh, you know, it, down in these details that sometimes it's good to step back and think about how we can creatively solve problems. And that's, that's going to be my goal moving forward. Right. So. Okay. 
Thank you, Johnny. Uh, I realise uh, we've taken up quite a bit of your time and you've got one of your famous video Q&As coming up in five minutes. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll let you go. Thank you very much for joining us, Johnny. Yeah, cheers, Johnny. Uh, cheers. Thank you. Good luck communitising the community. <laughs> yeah. It's time for a gooey love. Yes. Mm. Um, and this week's gooey love is from Alan, and it's a program called X Tile. Yeah, X Dash Tile. Uh, you can install it from the software center. And um, for those people who like tiling window managers where it uh, arranges your windows in like kind of squares or rectangles on your screen right. um, and brings you some you know very specific order to your desktop, it's a, a nice little add-on. Um, it'll sit in your indicator area and you can bring down a little menu and then just instantly rearrange your desktop to have everything lined up nicely Um Okay. Either like in a square, so you can have like four windows split screen, or you can have um, just a horizontal split with uh, one app at the top and one at the bottom. So it's just it just makes it easier than rearranging your windows all over the place <laughs> yourself by dragging them to certain parts of the screen. You just like press one button and bam, it rearranges them all. It's quite nice. Windows three point one one used to have a similar tile option. Yeah, it had tile all windows, didn't yeah. it? That mm. was the only option. But this has got lots more options than that. I cool. mean, it's very old and it's been around for a while. But it still works okay with yeah, Unity. Yeah, fine. Uh, I installed it on mine just because I wanted to. I had a bunch of terminals on my screen and they were kind of all overlapped all over the place. And I just wanted to have them all, you know, in an ordered, structured way. Right. So I just went tile them now. And I actually found this via uh, Software Center. The um, the recommendations thing down the bottom. Okay. It was just like a random app. I thought, oh, what's that? Click on it. Ah, oh, something new. Wow, there we go. Yeah. So X tile. X dash tile. Uh, X dash tile. Yeah, it's very the important. In the software center. And that's this week's gooey love. <laughs> And now it's time for your feedback. And Andy Gate on Google Plus said, I spent the morning in the charming company of Alan Pope and others. Two podcasts... <laughs> that'll be us then. That's us an Apple's. Two podcasts down, one to go. It made the two and a half hour wait outside my daughter's drama classes much more bearable. Only heard episode one of the new series, but I like the new format. Yay. I'll listen to the second this afternoon. You're welcome. Yes. He did well to stretch out one half hour episode over two hours, but uh, <laughs> listening to it four times to get every nuance of genius that we express. Yeah. Maybe. Benjamin Fox emailed in to rant. I reinstalled Ubuntu to try out the latest version. Lots of things were easier, others were horrendous. Notably, I cannot use Skype anymore because both four, uh, V4L is broken in it and the audio is atrocious. Firing up Skype gives overblown crackling audio and the microphone is so quiet as to be worthless. I'd blame Skype, but when I opened the settings, I found that all the audio has been handled by Pulse Audio. I cannot enable any sort of mic boost that actually stays in place. I can't turn down Skype. Out of the box, it's just dreadful. Why are we still using it if it's broken out of the box? Yeah, Alan, sort it out. He's talking about Pulse Audio specifically. Yeah. Yes. I, well, I don't have a problem with it. No. On any no. of my machines. I mean, I have, like, I've forgotten that pain of having, like, a YouTube video playing and Skype not being able to use the microphone or, you know, listening to a video in VLC and something else complaining that the audio device is in use. I've just forgotten all of that because it just works for me. I don't know what, what I'm doing wrong that, <laughs> or, that, right. that makes Pulse Audio not painful for me. You've got the same laptop as Mark. Uh, well, Shuttleworth. No, no, he has um, he gold has laptop. One of the <laughs> he, has, he, has a, he has a platinum plated. Uh, no, he has a. I think he has a Dell. Uh, the new the new Dell Sputnik, mm. which is really nice. So well, a couple of things spring to mind. One is that Skype actually has an option in it in the audio configuration settings that, that says it lets Skype manage your levels. And if you're finding you have a setting that isn't sticking around, that will be because Skype is trying to adjust it. So if you uncheck Could that be, yeah. option, then it might allow you to adjust levels in the mixer app and then stick around. And if you've um, got any other problems with Tony, <laughs> we'll be answering them next time in Ask Tony. Ask Tony. <laughs> no, we're not doing it. Um, Rich the Tech Hammer posted on the forums to say... I'm pretty. I'm a pretty excited Ubuntu user. Experienced. <laughs> <laughs> 
Wow. I'm a pretty experienced Ubuntu user. I've been listening to your excellent show. I really enjoy the news. One subject that I have not been able to find a complete guide to is the Grub Bootloader. Yes, there are guides at various places on the web, but none of them seem to help my version of Grub. I can sympathise with this. You see, for me, Grub just works. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. But... <laughs> is, it, is it that only, you only have one operating system installed at a time and it's Ubuntu? No, one both, hard disk. both of my machines have... One of them has three drives. This one has two. This one's got Windows and Ubuntu dual boot. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I think there is a lack of very good documentation for Grub 2 at the right. moment. Uh, it's a, configuration is much more complicated than it used to be. Mm. It is. It's kind of, I can I can forget wherever the config is every time. There's, I have a, to there's go a, and a, it. a GUI tool called Grub Customizer, which I've used for a few oh. things like changing the background and fiddling with the menu options. That seems to work. Well, there we go. Excellent Grub Customizer. Excellent. Probably with a Z. Laura, what's next? David Bashir's asked us. Once upon a time, Palimpsest came in Ubuntu. Then Red Hat changed its name to Gnome Disks and muted it for all eternity. I've spent countless hours looking for a PPA to install Palimpsest on Quick Quack, but to no avail. What can I do? There were just lots of words in there that I didn't understand. <laughs> okay, let's take this one, p- one piece at a time. What is Palimpsest? Palimpsest is the disk utility. It's the thing that lets you see what the smart errors on your disks are. It, it lets you format disks, partition disks. It's like Gparted, but a nicer looking okay. thing than, and not so scary. Mm. Um, it even lets you set up RAID arrays and stuff. It's, it's, quite, it's quite comprehensive. But the developer, David Zuthan, I think, works for Red Hat. And he mm-hmm. made some UI changes. And they renamed it from the hideously named Palimp set to <laughs> disks. Gnome disks. Yeah, it's just called yes. disks. Right. Is that what we see in the dash if we go in search for disks? Yeah, if you just type disks. Disks. So partition uh, a disk or whatever. It's the always disk utility or something. Yeah, yeah disk, disk utility. utility. Is that the same thing or is yes. that different? Okay. It basically shows you a, a view of each of your uh, disks and they could be internal or they could be USB disks or whatever on the left-hand side. And when you mm. click on one, you get a, a window on the right. And and David's point that it's been neutered and it, uh, simplified or dumbed down or whatever, um, I, I'm not sure you'll ever find a PPA with Pelimp set in it because that's basically an old version of disks. Yeah. And you, you're you're effectively just going back a version. I mean, someone could get the source for Pelimp set <laughs> from an older release and rebuild it for a newer yeah. version of Ubuntu, but... Um, it'll be unsupported and you won't get bug fixes and there's a chance it, it might, won't work with newer devices it might eat your kittens or something you know disk mm. seems pretty comprehensive whenever i've used it mm. so i've been it's really nice. you probably don't want to be using unsupported software when you're partitioning your hard drive <laughs> uh live life on the edge use dd <laughs> <laughs> someone jelly left a comment on the website saying consider this a rousing endorsement of the new podcast format Cutting to just half an hour and issuing an episode every week was a great idea. Now, whose idea was that? Now, what about that theme music? Surely time for an upgrade. Yes, if there are any uh, modern, (laughs) out-of-copyright songs that we could use. We can upgrade to the 1930s. Maybe they'll have done a new album. Yeah, five years have passed. We we can move on five years from 1936 or whenever we got this from. Yeah. And finally, you, Shui Camp, emailed to say... Thanks for the Ubuntu interview in last week's episode. I'm downloading it right now to listen to it again. I really enjoy the new format. It's good to get a weekly fix instead of a two-week wait. Well, it's That's nice to know we're doing something right. Yeah, it's nice to get that kind of feedback because we just didn't know how it would be received, did we? Except Tana, who's sitting there smug. <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't know, but it's great to hear that lots of people are enjoying it. Yeah. And that's the end of your feedback. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that tickles, titillates, or taunts you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. We really would like to hear from you, so go on, do your duty, keep calm, and compose an email. That's all. For this <laughs> <laughs> Edit that bit. Out. That's all for this episode. Join us on Wednesday, the twenty seventh of March at twenty thirty UTC, and we'll be back live. Wait. Yeah. Any idea what we're going to be talking about? Nope. nope.
<laughs> We're that well, organised. that's good. <laughs> Have we got any interviews lined up? Nope. nope. Uh, any ideas for interviews? Well, yeah, maybe yes. we should ask uh, people in the community if you have any ideas who we should interview. Uh, could be anyone. Then uh, drop us an email podcast at uk.org. Bye. <laughs>